Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Today we will be talking about a very eventful race in Namur, which was the second round of the World Cup. I'm joined as usual by Twan and Issa. Hello. Hey everybody. As you might hear, I have a bit of a cold, so hopefully that won't hamper me too much during the recording of this podcast. But anyway, we'll dive straight into into it the world cup in namur the second round it was a great race and as predicted there was a battle between pitcock van aert and van der poel tell us about it isam so yeah it was a very eventful race indeed it was um van turenhout who had a good start van der poel as well van aert had a good start but it was Iserbeet who missed his start a little bit uh, his chain dropped and uh, he was basically out of this race uh, from the get-go uh, tonaerts had a pretty bad start pitcock was all right um but pitcock was going to be again the main guy of this race he he found that the pace was too low again and just paced himself up front got a gap and there were actually three main guys that were chasing him down it was um van turen out the leader of the world cup uh, together with uh, van der poel and Wout van Aert, who came back from his uh, training camp. And these four were going to battle it out, actually, for the win. Uh, van Turenhout was struggling a little bit, keeping it behind. Van der Poel came very close to Pitcock. Then came, again, the gap became bigger. It was in the end that Van Aert, who brought them back, who brought uh, Van der Poel back to, to um, Pitcock. Uh, and we were looking to have a three-way battle into the last lap. And in the end, it was then Van der Poel who attacked. Van Aert, who was trying to follow, couldn't follow it. The pace was too high. And Van der Poel was just, in the end, the strongest and won that race uh, with Wout van Aert in second. And it was Tom Pitcock who led most of the race, unfortunately, in third. As you said, it was Tom Pitcock who led most of the race. And most of this time, he looked to be in control. He maintained a gap that was pretty similar. I already tweeted it out. Um, I thought, personally, that there were two key things to this. And I would like to think how you guys think about this. Um, The first key thing was his uh, changes of biking. His changes of bike, sorry. Um, Pitcock uh, changed every two or three laps, whilst Van Aert and Van der Poel changed every lap. And every lap, Van der Poel and Van Aert were actually stronger, and Van Turenhout as well. They closed uh, a few seconds every time. But then, every time they closed three or four seconds, but they lost it by changing the bike. And in the lap that Pitcock and Van der Poel changed bikes, it was Van der Poel who actually made a mistake that lap, so Pitcock was more consistent. To me, these were the two key reasons why Pitcock kept on leading this race and looked to be in control. How do you guys think about this? Yeah, I think those are definitely factors. Uh, he's, of course, done an amazing ride here. Um, I, I haven't gotten an exact look at the lap time, but I, I felt like it might have gotten a little slower toward the end for him, whereas Van der Poel was able to accelerate, um, which uh, was, of course... Uh, uh, a reason that uh, we end up with an 11 second difference in the advantage of uh, Van der Poel. Uh, it, it's a very beautiful race and I, I think he rode amazingly. Yeah, I think in terms of lap times, the first two laps were pretty consistent. Then they had a third slower lap. Uh, and then from the fourth onwards, it was it was again pretty fast. I think the fourth one was maybe the fastest. Uh, that was also the attack actually of, of Pitcock, uh, or his second attack actually. Yeah, I, I think for, for, for Pitcock, it was a bit of an uh, illusion, his gap, in a way. Especially because, of course, Van der Poel and Van Aert were changing bike every lap. Uh, that, you know, that gives you two, two, three seconds, maybe. Uh, and especially where, in such a race where the gaps are very tight, that gave Pitcock the advantage over the course of the race, uh, every time he didn't change bikes. And he just rode a perfect race. There were not so many mistakes made from his side, uh, both technically as uh, the way he was riding in general. And it's a shame to see him in the end after such a long uh, leading, you know, uh, in, in such a long leading position to in the end lose the race uh, and not only finish second but third. I can confirm the part about the lap times. The first seven laps, it was Pitcock who put the in the fastest lap. And the last two laps, it was Van der Poel. The fourth lap of Pitcock was as fast as the last lap of Van der Poel. And that brings me to this last lap of Van der Poel. He was really fast there, putting in a 6 minute 41, 22 kilometers an hour, that is, on such a parkour that's super fast. He dug really deep there. What does this tell you about, the, about Van der Poel, his form, and more his race in general today? Well, I think 
how I looked at the race, um, and I don't know if 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 you share it, uh, if you share the opinion, but in my opinion, it it felt like he had a very hard moment, especially the moment where Van Aert chased Pitcock down and actually closed the gap. I think at that point I was like, well, I think Van Van der Poel should be happy if he could follow this these two uh, to the finish, and it was like the moment they joined Pitcock. That Van der Poel was just um, reborn again and had had enough panache in the legs to you know to make that gap in in the last lap and it was a incredible last lap especially at such a race which is so demanding physically to put in such a lap in the end is uh, it's just showing that it's uh, he is a class apart and a and a very talented rider. Yeah, if I I think uh, Van der Poel at times definitely. Uh, didn't really look like returning to Tom Pitcock. And I thought the moment that uh, Van Aert comes in front of him on the steep hill where they had to run up, uh, I, I thought that was really a moment where uh, Van der Poel was going to come third and that Van Aert and Pitcock would end up battling it out. But as um, it is Van Aert who closes the gap and then they sit up on, on that uh, little bit of road section. And it's like Van der Poel just recovered like so much more than the other two and was just able to get back into those accelerations and then up that hill you immediately see him and it's just very impressive what he does immediately uh gaps pitcock as well and yeah from i I think if they hadn't slowed down there it might have been a very different race it looked as if the moment they caught pitcock it sort of awoken him that he thought whoa i can still win here oh this is good let's give it let's give it everything and you could see after the finish that he really did he just sat there for two minutes just breathing and catching a breath and i think that's the one of the beautiful things that this sport has to offer us then wout van aert the man who then ended second I mean, during the race, I didn't think at any point, oh, Van Aert is going to win this race. And even during the last lap, he was semi-close to Van der Poel, but he always had the feeling, yeah, Van Aert is good, but not good enough. Mm, yes, I, I have to say, though, that the lap that they catched Pitcock up again, uh, so the, actually the, the lap that Van Aert closed the gap down, that I was pretty positive about the chances of Van Aert winning. Um, he looked very strong at that moment. And the way he closed that gap, no mistakes uh, in in the technical parts. It really looked strong, and I was I was very positive uh, for his winning chances. But in the end, yeah, it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't going to be like that. Yeah, I think that was definitely the moment where I, I also had the feeling this this might actually be Wout van Aert's day. But then, about twenty seconds later, it, it's Van der Poel accelerating like that, and it, it feels like a whole different day again. Um, yeah, it just it, Wout van Aert was definitely close, but you, I don't know, it, there was something missing for me, uh, just slightly for the win. However, I do agree with f- what Van Aert said in his interview. He said he was maybe a bit better than he expected to be here because he came back from a training camp and that he can move forward with this performance towards the rest of the season. And I can definitely agree with him because I think um, this definitely shows that Van Aert is better than he has been the last two seasons because if you remember back from the pool, here took his fourth win out of the last five years here. One year Van, Van Aert won here, but the other years... Van Aert wasn't as close as he was here, so I think we can be in for some uh, good races in the rest of the season between those two. And of course, Tom Pitcock and perhaps even Eli Isebiet. Then let's take a look at the entire top 10. Behind the podium of Van der Poel, Van Aert and Pitcock, we find the World Cup leader Michael van Toornhout in front of Quinten Hermans. Then we see Lars van der Haar in front of a disappointing Toon Aert who only managed 7th. Then in 8th place we see Dan Soete, 9th for Corne van Kessel and 10th for Ryan Kamp. It's a bit hard to say um, anything about this because the camera is really focused on the front 3 and sometimes we got a shot of Van Toornhout. So what can we say about Van Toornhout? He's still leads the world cup standings but do we think he can hold on to this lead for the rest of the world cup i think this was a very strong ride by von Turenout, but uh I, I think today we really see that 
he doesn't quite have it. Uh, of course, uh, just three rounds remaining. Uh, but Van Aert is closing quickly as well now. And uh, with Van der Poel getting underway with 40 points, uh, he actually has a shot at winning this uh, if he keeps this up. I think it's good to mention as well the um, puncture of Van Turnout, which he got in the race. Um, that hampered him, of course, a little bit. I think it wouldn't have changed much in the results. Um, but, I mean, for Van Turnout, it was, it was a very, you know, very good race from his side to be that close to these three. Um, it is just very good, and I mean, for his classification, is also not that bad. He's still leading, uh, and you know he has still chances to keep this classification um, on the top and, and and still win this classification. So Michael van Tour now then in fourth. I don't think he had the exact level as he had two weeks ago or three weeks ago when he was winning the races, but definitely a solid performance in fourth and without that puncture, he would probably not have been a minute down, but maybe 40 seconds and it just looks better on the results. But he was actually the only one of his team to have a really good performance. I mean, okay, Ryan Kamp ended in 10th, but I was more talking about Lauren Zweig in 19th and then Isabitu got unlucky there with that mechanical 31st here. His hopes of winning the World Cup, which was his main goal, which he said at the beginning of the season, went up into smokes here. 31st then, just like last year, it goes wrong in Namur. So he's out of the World Cup uh, standings. Do we think he should still race the remainder of the World Cup? Because there's a really busy period of races coming up. Uh, so maybe he should skip Dendermonde and focus fully on the World Championships? I think that's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't think he would actually do it. Um, although I, I don't actually think this is a bad idea. Um, there, there's definitely some races that maybe for uh, the confidence level would be more interesting to ride than, uh, for example, the World Cup in Dendermonde and then Hulst as well. Could ride Gullegem the day before where we're probably not going to have an amazing starting field. Um, yeah, so I think it could be amongst the possibilities. I, I don't actually expect him to do it though. For 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 Ezerbeet, it's it's going to be I guess putting the focus more on the Super Prestige and XO Balkans Trophy. Um, I think for him to focus fully now on the World Championship is a bit too far, but it's definitely you, you can definitely switch focus during the season. And I think that is that is what he's going to um, decide somewhere this week. Uh, he's going to talk that through with his with his coaches, and then he's going to make a decision about that. He is he is standing very well in both the XO Balkans Trophy where he has a two minute lead and in the Super Prestige he had a four four uh, four points gap on Tone Arts who didn't look good as well today. So I I think for him that the championships will now maybe have a little bit bigger priority and he can focus now a little bit more on that since his main goal um, is 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 now gone in. I don't think he will skip the World Cup, but I just thought it was worth mentioning because there's a lot of races coming up in the upcoming weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know you need to be smart, uh, especially for such a rider, to not, um, you know, break up everything that you already got in terms of shape. And, and when the championships arrive in January and the World Cup Championships as well, that you are so tired of all these races that you have done in this Christmas and uh, the end of the year period that you are you know not able to perform at your or at your level on the championships Then, of course, there was also the women's race. In absence of Anne-Marie Vorst, there was a strong field taking the start. Twan, what happened in that race? It was Kata Blanca Vash who took a quick start, followed by Betsma. Unfortunately, a crash for Vash knocked her back quite a bit. Uh, and it was Brandt who slowly but surely started catching up with Denise Batsma. And eventually, somewhere, I think in the second lap, she was able to do it. And she started slowly but surely moving away from her as well. Uh, didn't put a foot wrong the rest of the race and would come in solo with a solid margin to second second place which actually wasn't Batsma as she got accompanied by Honsinger and by uh, world champion Alvarado after a flat tire and it would be Honsinger who would get the better of the two Dutch women uh, Batsma finishing in third world champion Selina Carmen Alvarado coming in fourth. 
So that Brand wins here, it's definitely not a surprise, at least to us. We said it in the preview podcast, we expected Brand to win. And she makes it three in a row here in Namur. And it's her, what's it, seventh or eighth win of the season already. Definitely a strong showing by her. She's definitely the best cyclocross rider in the women's field at the moment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we had discussed this, of course, in the, in the preview and... I think the previous results just have shown that Brandt was uh, on a certain point unbeatable, uh, and and today just showed again that she that she is the strongest uh, woman in that field, and there is not much you can do about that. I think Betsma had a very strong start, and that she really uh, tried to put pressure on um, on Brandt. In the end, it didn't work out, but uh, I think it's a very solid effort from Betsma and. Um, you know, uh, in the end, maybe it would have cost her that um, second place, but in the end, uh, Hong Singer, of course, just like she did in Havre, a very good race, and it's very good to see her on that podium. So then it was Hansinger who ended second, and she rode a pretty good race, not the best start, not the best starting position either. So she overtook quite some riders for a time she was on the move with Evie Richards, in the end ending second in front of Betsema. I do think that Betsema would have had the upper hand on Hansinger without that puncture, because she lost the lead of almost 30 seconds due to that puncture, which was unfortunate, but nevertheless, impressive performance by Hansinger here. It's only the second non-Dutch rider to stand on the podium uh, this season, before it was Eva Lechner in Beringen, so I think Hansinger can definitely be satisfied with this performance. Yeah, it's an absolutely superb performance. Uh, we saw she had to come from quite far after the first lap. I think on the cobble sector she had moved up to about 10th place. Uh, and she really had to come a long way. We we had a beautiful row of, uh, I think it was American, Luxembourg and uh, Italian champion. was quite nice to see. Um, and she just uh, yeah put in an amazing ride. I think indeed without the puncture, we might see someone else here in uh, second place, namely Den- Denise Betsma. But uh, nothing to take away from Honzinger's performance. It was uh, absolutely stunning. Definitely good to see some different nationalities coming into the mix. And my eye for talent has also spotted another talented American a bit further down in the results. Uh, Madigan Munro, 18 years old, also riding for the Trek Racing Cyclocross team, ending in 19th, which is definitely a strong performance for her, the first year under 23. And I think uh, America is definitely having some talent coming through. And I think for the upcoming years, the Dutch dominance will... Uh, seriously be challenged because if you look at the rest of the top 10 you also see Voss, Richards and Kay definitely some riders that uh, rode uh, good races here today yeah definitely and you know that's always how it goes with domination you you can dominate for one two three four years but in the end it's it's always going to turn on you and uh, it's very good to see that we have uh, multiple nations now um, getting closer and closer to these Dutch women and uh, it's just good to see for the women cycling in general. Cyclocross uh, really needs that and uh, it's just very good to see. If we take a look at the entire top 10, we saw that Brandt won in front of Honsinger and Betsma. Alvarado got 4th, not a parkour that really suited her here. Vos got 5th in front of Richards, Kay and Annick van Alphen. And the top 10 is rounded off by Perrine Clozel and Eva Lechner. First two names that I want to put the spotlight on here is Vos and Richards. Vos... Um, Starting fast and then a um, bit, uh, bit of a blow up in the middle of the race, but then a strong recovery at the final part. Richard starting all the way at the back, having a crash or at least some kind of incident in the uh, start as well. And then still managing to overtake uh, a bunch of riders, ending sixth. What do we make out of the performances of these two riders today? I thought for Vosch that we were seriously going to see something that we saw in Havre as well. And that was like a fallback to like 15th place. A really strong recovery from her. And uh, the same can be said for Evie Richards. Uh, started off quite poorly. Uh, managed to fight her way up the field and uh, kept it going steadily. Uh, and yeah, very nice performance today. Yeah, I, th- I think for, for Richards, we, we knew that she needed a few races under her belt to get some uh, some better results. Uh, we saw already that in Havre there was a little bit of improvement. Uh, and in the end, uh, in, in Namur getting a solid top 10, very close to, to to the fifth. So I think that she really did a good job. For Fuss, I was a little bit worried in the first lap that it was going to be a hard afternoon for her. But um, 
fair play she fought herself uh, back into into contention and uh, got got also a very good result then two other names that are actually ninth and 10th. We In ninth we saw Clausel in front of Lechner. Two mountain bike riders performing well here. Not a surprise looking at the parkour. But it's good to see them in the top 10. And I mean for Clausel, do, if she focuses more on cyclocross, do we think that she can consistently be in the top 10? Because this season so far has been a bit on and off with her. I think it would mostly be for these type of park horses. Uh, I, I definitely think she would be able to do it uh, more consistently if she focused more on it. Um, so I, I, that that would always be a good thing for anyone. I mean, we see it this season with Brandt, who is just exceptional. Well, then, I think we've had it for the women's race. The next race is already around the corner. In two days' time, we will be racing in Essa. We're not going to talk about this too long. There won't be a preview episode either. But just a brief look ahead for the men's race in Essa. Van der Poel and Pitcock uh, are both at the start. Do we expect a battle between those two? Uh, of course, um, I, I think uh, that about uh, that is really the top of the start list, and uh, hopefully they will make for an interesting race. Yeah, I I think we cannot expect less than a battle. Um, but you know we have to see how the race develops. Uh, for at, at least at the men's race and for the women's races, we just have to see what's going to happen. Uh, it's not a classified race; it's a C one race. Uh, so we really have to see um, who is very motivated to. Uh, to have a good result in this race and um, will definitely be fun to watch for the women's race we have um, Marianne Vos making her comeback I don't know the exact number but she has a lot of world titles in the field and road um, so what do we expect her to do because I don't know the exact start list for the women's race because it's not published but I do think that um, Alvarado is taking the start and so is Brandt but don't correct me on that one I'm not too sure but just in general what do we expect about Vos well, I, I expect that she is going to really need this race to come back in. Um, she she has she has been away for for quite a while, and um, I think this is the perfect race to start. I guess. Um, hopefully for her, it's not really going to be that muddy. Uh, then she can just um, make her way through, and um, you know, it's it's very hard to say what she's going to 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 perform, but. Um, a good false would be in the top 10, I think. Yeah, I think the, her performance will really depend on what kind of start list we'll have. I don't expect her to uh, battle for victory against the likes of uh, Brandt and Alvarado right away, uh, especially with the kind of form that those two women are on. Um, yeah, I think it's also a great cross to come back to uh, into the field. And hopefully she'll do well and uh, take confidence into the rest of the Christmas period. Well, we will see how that goes. Last year, Vos won the cross in SA in front of Vas and NRK. We'll see what will happen there. And of course, there'll be a podcast about the Etias cross in SA. And that will come the day after SSO on Wednesday morning, that is. So if you're listening to this on Monday, this uh, the Cross and SSO is actually immediately the day after that. And I would like to thank Ton and Isan for joining me today uh, to talk about this eventful race here in Namur. Thank you for hosting and uh, it was an exciting race for sure. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And then... Um, with that said, it's about time to round off this episode of the Cyclocross Social Podcast. I would like to thank every single one of you for listening. Have a great Christmas period and hopefully you have some time in that period to watch the Cyclocross because there is definitely a lot of Cyclocross around the corner which is going to be probably as exciting as we saw today. So stay around, give the podcast a follow on YouTube or on whichever audio platform you're listening and I will see you guys on Wednesday morning for the Cyclocross for the Etios Cross in Essa. Goodbye. Ciao.